All right, and we are live. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Uh, very happy to be here um, in conversation with my good friend and great friend of Wealthion, Stephanie Pomboy. So let me bring her in here. Hi, Steph. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for joining us again. Um, as we've done a few times now, um, I'll just remind folks that um, normally I do sort of a formal, you know, deep dive, long interview. Uh, with somebody, sometimes you, uh, every morning on this channel. But um, with you, since you are such a special friend of the channel and such a great mind, you know, we've left the door open to say, hey, if there's, you know, any moments where you're just sort of seeing something that grabs your attention that you'd like to share with a wealthy on audience, we'll kind of call an audible and just bring you on to talk about it. So that's what we're going to do briefly here today. Um, uh, this is live. Steph and I are operating without a net here. So folks watching, please forgive any little glitches that may go on here. Um, but one of the benefits of doing it live is we will be able to take a few live questions from the audience after Steph and I uh, walk through the data we're about to walk through here. Uh, now, Steph, um, looks like, uh, you know, <laughs> let, let, me, let me summarize it this way. Um, I've had a lot of trouble on this program recently. We try to be as objective as we can. So we try to look at the macro environment from the bullish and the bearish side. On the bullish side of late, I've had a really hard time coming up with a bullish argument, except that prices have just been going up since the start of this year, right? So the yeah. tape is almost the only bullish argument that can be made. Now, that said, there has been some data that's come out recently that, that the bulls have pointed to and said, hey, this is actually really bullish data. Right. Um, you've taken a look at some of it and you've said, Mm, it might not be bullish data. It might be bull something else, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, anyways, let's let's dive into this because I know that you recently wrote a piece for uh, for your clients, uh, digging into the retail sales data. Um, I, I think you know some auto data as well. So, yeah. let, let me just tee the ball up there for you and let you run. Okay, great. Well, first, um, a quick disclaimer because the last time you and I had one of these conversations, there were a lot of comments. Um, about why it is that my name is in small caps and yours is in, you know, caps and whether that was some sexist thing on your part. And I want everyone to know that that is my doing because I'm too lazy to capitalize. So please um, lay off of Adam because this is entirely my responsibility. Well, geez, Jeff, I'm trying to carry the torch for the oppressive patriarchy here, but you're, oh you're, you're, showing, up here. <laughs> you're showing up that the uh, that toxic masculinity over there, but uh, no, anyway, so um, please, please um, re, uh, direct all comments to me on that score. Um, and when I can figure out how to capitalize my name re uh, belatedly, I will go back and fix that. But anyway, um, as it relates to retail sales, thank you so much for the, the intro, Adam, and for taking the time to have this kind of conversation, which um, I'll sort of forewarn your viewers, gets a little bit into the weeds in terms of how this economic data that we are served up every day is concocted. Um, and normally I wouldn't waste people's time getting into this stuff, except that the um, perception or the conclusions being drawn about the data that we've seen in the last couple of weeks um, are really um at risk of being very mislaid and the reason for that sort of goes back to that payroll employment report that caught everyone by surprise uh for january and what happens is as the economy moves from december to january uh we come off of this incredible holiday season in december i mean i forget what the percentage is for retailers you know how much of their year is made up in that final two months um, but it's something massive. It's a massive uh, chunk, yeah. Yeah, so that is the majority of their, their total revenue for the year is related to the holiday season at the end of the year. And obviously there are a lot of other things that happen. People take vacations, uh, so they spend on travel, they go out to dinners, uh, companies throw co corporate parties or they used to, and so they take out restaurants. And so there's a lot of spending that gets pushed into December. Um, there's a lot of hiring related to all of that spending and, and holiday stuff going on. Um, so that, you know, obviously gives us a boost in December. And when we come into January, there's a massive drop off. It's literally like a cliff. Um, and so, for example, when it comes to payroll employment, the economy every year sheds about 3 million jobs in the transition from December 
to January. That's a very standard. It happens every year. And so when that payroll employment uh, number caught everyone by surprise, a lot of people went in and said, huh, this is really uh, you know, an incredibly strong number that no one expected. What could have caused it? And some people got in over their heads talking about the seasonal adjustment and said, oh, look, you know, if you look at the non-seasonally adjusted data, um, you know, it was down 2.5 million. Well, what they don't understand is that the economy loses those 3 million jobs every January. So if you want to scrutinize any sort of shenanigans that might be going on in these numbers, you have to compare how did this January's assumptions compare to last January or the year before or the year before that? Were they markedly different? Did the BLS suddenly assume that a lot more jobs were going to be shed, for example, in January, and therefore, um, you know, if the same number were actually shed, it would look like it was much better than expected, you know? Um, I hope I'm explaining this okay, but let's... Oh, no, absolutely. Keep going. You're... Okay, so I'm thinking... I'm not a golfer, but a lot of people out there are golfers, and I, I like to describe it like par. You know, you're on a certain hole of the golf course. Let's say it's a three par hole. Um, par, you know, if you get if you get it in three shots, then you're basically even. Um, whereas if you take more shots, then you're behind, and vice versa. So seasonal adjustment is very much like PAR. And so the BLS and all the other statistical agencies use a model for each month of the year based on holidays and weather, et cetera. Um, and they build in assumptions as to how much retail sales should go up in you know, February, how much jobs should go down in July, blah, blah, blah. And so when you see numbers each day that are reported, they've already gone through this whole seasonal adjustment sausage factory. And what you're seeing at the other end is the adjustment uh, after they've gone through all of that. And so um, as was the case with payroll employment, where the standard shift from December to January is a massive decline of 3 million jobs. And it turned out this year, we only lost 2.5 million jobs and therefore it showed up as 500,000 jobs better than a typical January. Um, you have a similar situation in the retail sales where between December and January, uh, retail sales routinely decline 20%. That's just typical because you're coming off of this holiday season and people were spending a ton in December and they don't need to buy little Timmy as Christmas presents in January. They've done that. Um, so you generally see a 20% decline month to month from December to January in retail sales. Um, and so again, you know, what you want to go back and look at when these numbers are reported is, did they assume something different than a typical 20% decline in retail sales? And what you find out as you get through all these numbers, and the reason I'm taking the time to go through all this detail, is that this shift from December to January is the most dramatic churn we have of any month in the year. Um, those seasonal assumptions are so massive that, you know, 3 million job decline, the 20% decline in retail sales, that you can imagine it's very hard for the BLS and the other number crunchers to gauge accurately what the actual decline was to the nearest thousand job or the nearest tenth of a retail sales decimal point. I mean, it's virtually impossible. Mm -hmm. um, and the upshot of all of that is that these January data, because it's such a volatile month, um, are prone to massive revisions. So if you go back and look at the January retail sales report, for example, the average revision over the last five years to January retail sales has been a decline of 1.2 percentage points, which is massive. Um, and it puts that 3% gain that we saw in January into you know, better context. That when all is said and done, that 3% increase, sorry, did I say decline? That 3% increase that we saw for uh, retail sales in the month of January um, will probably be revised down to 1.8% when all is said and done, which is actually less than the consensus was forecasting going into the number. Um, so I, I again, I, 
I go through all the, the weeds on this because the point is the January data is highly unreliable. And you see a market that is seized on both the payroll employment report strength and the retail sales report strength is indicating that the Fed's going to have to be far more aggressive. In fact, uh, since that payroll employment report hit the tape, the peak Fed funds rate that the futures market is building in has increased 50 basis points. I mean, that's massive. Um, so they've really adjusted um, their expectations to a much higher terminal rate. Um, and the interesting thing kind of perversely is that it hasn't until yesterday, let's say, really dented the stock market quite the right. contrary. We've seen this massive rally. And I believe that's built on this sense that, well, the reason they're going to have to take rates higher is because the economy is so freaking strong and consumers <laughs> are spending so much money. So clearly they haven't tightened enough. It's sort of the market's interpretation. So they're going to have to tighten more, but it's going to take a lot to slow this incredibly strong, indestructible consumer. And that thesis, I think, is going to be sharply called into question as we get through the next couple months. All right. Um, so great painting of, of, of the picture here, Stephanie. And, um, uh, you know, those of us who watch the jobs data come out and then the retail status data come out, you know, we did scratch our heads right mm -hmm. when we first saw it and said, wait a minute, what's going on here? Right. You've done a really good job of saying, hey, even in the best of times, you got to take these January numbers with a massive dose of salt because of all the noise that you talked about and the massive seasonal drop off they're trying to account for. Um, and, and we know, like you said, that these are going to get revised down, right? So you said it wouldn't surprise you if the, the retail sales number gets adjusted down to about 1.8, right? right? Now, you talk in your, your missive here about the fact that those are still just nominal numbers, right? right? They're seasonally adjusted, but they're not inflation adjusted. And we've right. had massive inflation over the past year. So when you add inflation in there, and I'm going to use your words here, and I'll put up this chart as <laughs> yeah. I do, you say... Um, uh people haven't increased their purchase of stuff for two years all that has increased is prices so yes there's been some nominal increases yeah. in uh retail sales but when you real adjust it they've been flat as this chart shows here with the the real data being here in red yeah and what i think is stunning about this chart and i, and I denote it is that p retail, real retail sales stopped going up the moment the uh, stimulus checks stopped hitting the mailboxes. Yeah, look at that. It's like it hit a wall, literally. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, this is where these um, uh, narratives that the consumer is so strong leave me really puzzled because if anyone's looking at unit sales, you know, people aren't going out, as I said in that piece, they're not going out and buying more stuff. They're not buying more iPhones. They're not buying more cars etc. What they're doing is they're buying the same amount of stuff. They're just having to pay more for it than they did two years ago. Um, and so and we can get into a whole dissertation on the signs that consumers are reaching the point of exhaustion in terms of being able to absorb those higher uh, price increases, like, for example, the uh, massive run up in credit card borrowing and the drawdown in saving. But I think this chart pretty much uh, sums it up that the strong consumer narrative really leaves quite a bit to be desired. And then when, you know, when you get further into that January retail sales number, which is sort of a, a wasted effort, because again, it's going to be revised substantially in all likelihood. Um, the areas that really drove the strength in this were areas where you've seen massive discounting. For example, uh, there was a big increase in department store sales, specifically of women's clothing. And as someone who took advantage of some of those discounts, I can tell you they were nothing short of, of massive. Um, and then uh, the other thing was autos. And this is really sort of a bigger story that we're going to be looking at. Um, and Steph, sorry, real quick, before you go to autos, um, yeah. was the reason why there were such great discounts in things like women's apparel was because they had overstocked their inventories and then the demand didn't show up? Yeah, exactly. So it was sort of, you know, people have talked about this bullwhip effect um, following the whole pandemic supply chain issues where um, you had a period there where 
whether it was autos or women's clothing or shoes or washers and dryers and whatever you needed, you couldn't get it because of the supply chain issues. And so the second those issues seemed to be resolving, companies went out and they just, they ordered everything they could get their hands on. You know, we'll take 50 million uh, washing machines and whatever, because they figured, well, we've got a backlog of demand and then we'll satisfy that. And then we'll be able to sell all the future um, satisfy the future demand with, with our inventory. And of course the future demand, um, didn't materialize. Um, and so they've been stuck with all this inventory. Um, and you are seeing that also in the auto area, which, um, you know, that is really a profound, uh, area just because it has such knock-on effects for the broader economy, you know, housing and autos are, are two of the bigger sectors. Um, and so you've seen an increase in the, uh, you know, inventory to sales ratio for auto dealers. And uh, I mean, looking at that chart, it doesn't look like it's increased much. But if you put your hand over that COVID to supply disruption in 2020, um, you can see that we're actually back to what has been the peak prior, um, other than when we have a massive recession that mm -hmm. crushes demand like we did in the uh, you know global financial crisis in 2008-9. So we're really pushing high inventory levels and not surprisingly, uh, the response by auto dealers has been to cut price. And interestingly, um, you know, I'm not a, an authority on the auto market, but generally the new models come out in the fall. And if you go back and look at from September through January, that four month period, we've seen the largest decline in new and used auto prices since 2003. Um, and so 20 years, uh, that's substantial. And again, this is why um, that retail sales number is much less impressive um, than appeared at first blush when you go through and you look at what actually drove it, uh, no pun intended. Um, this this auto, <laughs> these auto discounts were a big part of it and the women's clothing. Uh, and then the final one was food services, basically, you know, uh, dining establishments. Um, and in that one, you know, I won't, I'll spare your uh, viewers too much of a, a deep dive on this, but there was some funny business, I would say, in terms of their assumption for how much uh, dining out would decline this January versus prior Januarys. And you can see that on this chart here, they assumed uh, an 11.6% decline from month to month coming off of the holiday inflated December. And as you can see, you know, going all the way back uh, to, to 99, we've only been down that low once before. Um, so it's, it's an unusually uh, generous, <laughs> let's say, assumption that they made. Um, and so that category alone was responsible for one full percentage point of the three percentage point gain uh, in, the, in the headline retail sales report. So again, it just, when you go through all these details, you become far less impressed uh, with the strength of the consumer. The strength of the consumer, exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and can you tell us, you got one more chart here I want to throw up. Um, can you tell us the difference between the resale, retail sales numbers that we saw earlier, which were the ones that were published, you know, to the, the big headlines, to the Red Book retail yeah. sales? Because this just shows retail sales have been deflating, you know, pretty much ever since we, we got into 2022. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is just weekly same store sales as reported by the industry itself. Um, whereas the first number and the one that I've been ranting on about the seasonal adjustment is all a concoction put forth by the government statistical agencies. So, so, so sorry to interrupt, but the, 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 the government report is by the, the bean counters with their Excel spreadsheets and their, mm -hmm. you know, their, uh, all the assumptions that they're putting in there and their birth death models and all this stuff. This is right. just, this is what's moving at cash registers across the country. Exactly. And so, frankly, I'd much prefer to look at what the industry itself is telling me than what the BLS wants me to imagine is the case. Um, and then ultimately, you know, this sort of comports much better with what you're hearing now from the companies themselves as they report their earnings. Um, you know, we had Walmart and Home Depot yesterday. Um, and it's it's clear that across the 
uh, consumer spectrum, there are clear signs of stress, particularly at the low end, not surprisingly. Um, but this chart suggests that, you know, you're going to see some very broad based um, declines or certainly um, slowdown in earnings growth for, for the consumer discretionary space, which we've seen already last year. Um, but that should accelerate, I would think, as we go through this year, especially if the Fed believes the headline payroll and retail sales numbers produced by the BLS and, and views that as a license to raise rates higher and hold them there longer, which is, we'll find out at two o'clock today if that's in fact what they all um, concluded at their at their last meeting when the minutes are reported. When the later. minutes come out. Yeah, I, I liken the data and the reason why we spend so much time talking about it is it's, it's, it's for the decision makers who are running the system. Mm -hmm. These reports are not unlike the instruments on a pilot's dashboard, right? And so the question really becomes is how accurate is your altimeter, right? <laughs> if you look at the BLS report, it says, oh, we're doing fine. We're cruising along at 30,000 feet. If you look at the Red Book retail sales, it's like, no, we're at 5,000 feet and heading down rapidly, right? Yeah. So yeah. a big question is, is, you know, are the pilots of our national economy and financial system using the right instrumentations or not? Are they going to keep us flying at a safe altitude or are they going to take us straight into a mountain? Yeah, and I, I mean, the number one, um, I guess, piece of their uh, s instrumentation that they're looking at that has me most concerned is obviously in the employment data, um, because even in good times, in the best of times, it's rear view looking, you know, Super it takes lagging, yeah. a long lag. And that's part of the reason why I think people were so confounded by that. 570,000 gain in the payroll employment is that we had just come off of, you know, three weeks of relentless layoff announcements where every day, you know, you got another 10,000 jobs laid off by some big tech company. Um, so it just didn't add up, you know, when you hear what companies are saying and doing, and then the BLS comes out and tells you, oh, no, you know, it, there, there's so much uh, job creation out there. So it's it's very dangerous for the Fed to be navigating through that rear view mirror, um, you know, normally. But now we're in a period where it seems especially like the what we're hearing in the real world and what these data are saying are really uh, going in different directions. And I would imagine that that will be resolved not by, you know, massive firing in the corporate sector, but rather by the BLS having to go back and revise down these numbers. I mean, there are other things that they put into that payroll report that are highly suspicious that we could do a whole other segment on, but <laughs> like yeah, the, birth, so, the birth death thing that you mentioned, et cetera. So the, there's a, a, a statement you make in here. I just want to underscore. Um, you say, just as January is prone to deliver upside economic surprises um, in terms of the data, yeah. So are February and March prone to delivering disappointments. Of course, by the time the Fed and Wall Street realize their mistake, it will be too late. Yeah. Um, and I know you're referring there to the Fed, you know, over tightening, right? Using this data yeah. to to hike higher for longer than it, it perhaps really should, um, given the deteriorating macro effects of the economy here. So, you know, it, it's interesting. I, I want to put up um, some just two charts real quickly. This should be a chart of Home Depot stock. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can see it kind of took a, a, a kick in the groin uh, yesterday, um, as did uh, Walmart. Um, they both disappointed, um, you know, after hours and their their earnings uh, forecasts. Um, and it's just more sign that, OK, you know, the, the, those are those are big consumer staple, you know, businesses. Uh, and they're revising down their their earnings. So that earnings recession that, that you've been predicting for a long time, Steph, seems to be manifesting yeah. here, right? And what's been so interesting right up until literally the past couple of days is the market has rallied hard since October. And at the beginning of this year, you know, the whole narrative changed, right? Everybody was bruised and, and nervous at the end of 2022. And then coming into 2023, it was like, oh, like we're not even worried about a soft landing anymore. Like we're 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 talking about the no landing situation, yeah. right? Where it's going to be great. And of course, folks like you and I are looking at the data and saying, how are people coming up with this, right? Right. Absolutely. And the market clearly, you know, every time Powell spoke, the market would, you know, rocket higher. Yeah. Basically, 
disbelieving him and or just hearing what it wanted to hear, no matter what words were coming out of Powell's mouth. And, and look, I don't think you and I uh, are particular huge fans of Jerome Powell, but he has been pretty consistent in his statements of saying, look, here's the data I'm looking at. You know, whether you agree with me or not, I'm using that as justification to keep hiking from here. I'm going to hike higher than the market is currently pricing in. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to pause eventually, and I'm going to hold it there probably through the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. And the markets have just continuously said, no, we don't believe you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and to your point, I, I think we're maybe now right at the beginning where the market is beginning to wake up to say, you know what, maybe we were a little bit overly exuberant here and we have to start repricing the exuberance that we've pumped into the market here. Um, as you and I are talking, the S&P is, is just cracked below 4,000. Um, we'll see what happens here over the next couple of days. I do just want to underscore, I've had a couple of technical analyst experts on this program recently, Sven Henrik uh, of Northman Trader being a very yeah. notable one. And Sven has said, um, the, the bulls and bears have been locked for a couple of weeks in what he calls the battle for control. And it's basically this range of 40, you know, 3950 to 4100 on the S&P. And he said, at some point, there's going to be a victor. And the way that things are sort of compressing from a TA perspective, whichever direction we break out in, we're probably going to break out pretty big. So mm -hmm. he feels like if we retest to this 4,000-ish level on the S&P and we rebound decisively, he said, then it's a green light to 43, 4,400 on the S&P. I can't make the, the macro fundamental argument right. for that, but I can see technically, okay, maybe things like that happen sometimes. But he says, if we break through 3950, there's really not a lot of support down there until about 3232, mm -hmm. which is about a 20% market drop. So it's very interesting because you've done a great job of showing how a lot of the key fundamentals here are deteriorating. We've sort of been fooling ourselves with these, this, this adjusted data that we're, we're looking at. Right. But if, if, Wall Street and the Fed kind of wake up and say, oh, gosh, you know what, like reality is a lot worse than we thought. Yeah, we could have that quick downdraft here. Well, and I think what's interesting about that and, you know, timing is definitely not my forte. It would be the first, to, you know, to acknowledge that. Um, but on this seasonal adjustment thing, um, as I said, and you alluded to in that piece, um, because the January assumptions are so weak, the data are prone to the prone to surprise on the upside. Um, but as we go into February and March, that seasonal bar begins to move back up again. And right. actually by March, you enter the steepest, or let's say the bar is set the highest it is of any month. So in a very short period of time, you go from having the bar being, you know, think about your limbo, you know, the bar being incredibly easy to or to pole vault over if you've got the bar basically on the floor in January and then all of a sudden it's all the way you know seven feet tall in March so you have this two-month period where you go from this massive woohoo the data look fabulous in January and then they look like garbage in when you get into the March April period so there's a real potential um that that whole uh scenario that Sven outlined there could happen because of this seasonal swing that causes people to massively reassess their assumptions about how strong the economy really is and it could happen in very short order i mean we won't get the march data until you know we get into early april um but the february data could also disappoint and that's coming up you know in the next week or so we'll start to see some of those numbers so I'll be watching closely to see exactly what happens there. Okay, great. And and Steph, I've I've kept you a little bit longer than I said I would on on just our talk here. Um, if we can, I'd love to turn to just take just a couple of questions from the yeah. audience here. I know you don't have a full hour here, so I'm trying to be respectful of your time. Yeah. Um, folks, if you've got questions for Stephanie, ask them here in the live chat, and I'll pull up from them. And as I'm waiting for one here, Steph. Um, let me just ask you, so the, the the CPI, I know that you have been on the side of saying that, hey, it, it, it's going to come down faster than I think most people realize um, because of the slowing economy and all these factors that we're talking about. And even if you look over at year over year comparisons, um, right. they, they, they start getting more favorable to it, to a CPI coming down faster than not. 
Um, that get, but what's interesting is about sort of halfway through the year, then the comparisons go back. Saying, hey, it, may, it may start rising just from that that perspective. Do, do you do you see the potential for that, or do you think that things are slowing so fast that it's just going to pull everything down with it? Well, I mean, the the easy conclusion here is that this is going to be an incredibly volatile year um, because you have all these cross currents. You have, you know, this seasonal thing from January to March. And then uh, May is really the month where the base effects of that math on the CPI are the most profound. In other words, May is the month where you might see the steepest drop in terms of the year on year numbers. We could come from, you know, three and a half to two and a half in that one month time frame. Um, so everyone, including the Fed, might say, OK, wow, you know, uh, we've got the attraction on inflation. Now maybe they can start to ease off just as we get into that, you know, next leg where right. the math becomes complicated. And all of a sudden, even if you know, the fundamentals in the economy have a cooling of the inflation pressures. The math is going to be so challenging that it's going to probably push the year on year numbers higher, notwithstanding. I mean, you'd have to see significant deflation in the economy, um, particularly in housing. And, and that could happen because it's such a lag um, getting those home prices to actually get reflected in that shelter component, which is, you know, more than a third of the CPI. So that could happen, but uh, suffice to say, there's a lot of chop um, in that period as we go through the summer when it comes to the inflation picture. And I think the Fed, um, you know, they might get duped into thinking that, uh, that it's mission accomplished uh, only to have to, reverse course, which would be the worst thing possible for the Fed. It, it, yeah, and that's what I was going to ask, which is, let's say the Fed come April, May is thinking, OK, CPI is really coming down pretty well. You know, maybe we can get to our pause. And then all of a sudden the CPI upticks for a month or two. I imagine the response to that is going to be, oh, my God, we got to keep tightening even further. And now we're talking about a six plus percent Fed funds rate. Right. Well, it's certainly an argument for them to hold rates higher longer, to to take time to assess the impact of what they've done. And like right. you said, Powell has reiterated that at every single press conference. They've said it in the minutes. Um, and yet the market is just like, blah, blah. You know, we think the second the uh, Fed fund trade peaks, the very next meeting, they're going to be cutting. They're going to bring it down. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Um, so it's, they're not hearing any of that. They think we're going to hit the terminal rate and then immediately be cutting because I guess they think the Fed will have overdone it. And yet that's not reflected in their expectations that stocks should go up because earnings are going to be fine in the economy. So right, right. I mean, if the Fed were forced to do that, if it literally had to do that, those would be wildly non-bullish conditions exactly. for the market, right? I, yeah. think, I can't think of what would be bullish about that, but. All right. So um, you mentioned the terminal rate. So question here, what's your opinion of a required terminal rate before a pause? Well, when you're asking someone who, um, one, never thought they would tighten in the first place because I thought that the taper would be sufficient to inflict damage and get them to back away. Um, and two, certainly never imagined they would tighten as much as they have. And, and right. frankly, I do believe that they've massively over tightened already. That's what I was going to say. That's your third. You don't think they should be tightening anymore. <laughs> right. I, I mean, I think they probably had well overdone it back, you know, in the fall of last year, they could have stopped. So um, at this point, I think they're just basically driving a stake through the heart of a consumer that's already dead. Um, and uh, so I, I would guess that when, if and when we see that evidence that things are much weaker, we will get a pivot of significant proportion, um, but it will be blood in the streets that is the catalyst for that. Um, so that's not really an answer to the question. But no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, think you, I think you gave him exactly where you are in that. Um, Constantine asks here, is it true that liquidity has improved since October 2022? And it's interesting. I've, I've now seen a number of charts yeah. that have shown that global liquidity has increased since then. And it's it's at least what I've seen is Japan, China, 
Um, and then some people are saying uh, the TGA, right? The Treasury General account right. okay. um, has been basically doing sort of a stealth QE to a certain extent, you know, uh, you know supporting the Treasury market from the Treasury zone sort of savings account. Um, curious your thoughts there on, on global liquidity. Well, I think this gets back to that whole conversation about the markets ignoring the Fed, because um, as the stock market has rallied since October and the corporate credit market has rallied, it has eased financial conditions, which is uh, working at cross purpose to exactly what the Fed is trying to do. Um, so the question how long it will continue really depends on how long the markets continue to ignore the message that the Fed is sending and or how long the Fed continues to adhere to that message. And right now, it doesn't seem to me that they show any signs of abandoning that higher for longer message and that they want to see a tightening of financial conditions. Um, so it's just a question of when the markets finally accept that reality. And frankly, it's been almost a year to the day, you know, when the Fed first started raising rates and the market is just basically poo-pooed everything the Fed has said for that entire stretch of time. Right. So is it, is it, could that could it be as simple <laughs> that this market rally has been just a function of that liquidity? Uh, yeah, I mean. And, and, and that the narratives have just been laid on top of it to justify it, but but yeah, literally yeah. the fact That's that- the It's like a, yeah. a chicken egg thing, you know? So I think part of it, uh, in my view, a lot of it has been this sense that the consumer is strong. It's one of those things that is said on CNBC every day, all day long, and no one presses that, no one pushes on that and says, wait, what, how can you say the consumer is strong when they're you know, running up record credit card balances at the highest interest rates in history, 20% on average. I mean, it's insane. They're not doing that because they feel good and want to take another vacation. Um, so uh, I think that's been the, the problem, in my view, and part of it is due to, you know, these numbers like the, the retail sales report, but more importantly, I think it's all this employment. Everyone, you hear the argument, we can't have a recession when the employment rate is, unemployment rate is this low. Um, and that actually isn't factually correct, but mm -hmm. it is another sort of uh, thesis that, or narrative that gets uh, embraced out there as a rationale for the stock market to keep going up. And then, as you said, you know, that feeds on itself and then you get the easier uh, financial conditions. And, you know, it's sort of in the corporate credit market, which has been an area that I've been really concerned about as that debt has to roll. There's a trillion dollars in corporate debt that has to roll this year at substantially higher interest rates. Um, as conditions have eased in that market, companies are seizing that opportunity to refinance as much as they can. Yes, they're paying higher rates, but they're at least able to lock in something that's not as usurious as it was five, six months ago. So it does have that effect of helping to ease the entire um, impact of the Fed's rate hike, which just means that they're going to have to do more if they really want to get the results thereafter. Right, right. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, it's, you see, Powell, there's some questions here about things like reverse repo keep keeping going on and, and the other things that are causing conditions to, to remain looser than the Fed would like. Um, uh, you know, it, it's it's interesting because that's the market continuing to fight the Fed and it's the Fed having to react to that, which is going to make things even worse for the market in the long run. Right. It's this it's this really weird game of self-destructive game of chicken that's going on. All right, Stephanie, um, we will wrap up with this one last question here as I ask it, folks, um, if you could do us a favor, if you enjoy this format here, let us know in the uh, in the live chat here. Um, if folks like it, we'll, we'll keep doing it as long as you guys are enjoying it. Um, this is kind of a fun one to end on from Greg. Seems obvious that Powell is purposely using bad slash lagging data in order to kill the Fed put. No way is he this obtuse. Do you agree? Um, I've had that same thought myself, Greg. Um, I, I, how is it possible that uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, who has a fleet of, I think it's 400 PhD economists, um, in addition to the thousands of other staffers there, uh, doesn't understand that the consumer is stretched and that the employment data is lagging and that there are seasonal adjustment 
noise, you know, in a lot of these data. Um, and if you go down that thought process, um, you conclude, as, as Greg mentioned, that maybe he's trying to repeal the put. Um, and that's a pretty scary idea. I mean, I respect it. Gosh, I, I did actually unplug this, but well. <laughs> Oh my God! I, it must have a charge still. I love your I love your technical challenges that you can even unplug a device and it can still find a way to I work. Know. And, get it, yeah. and yet, when I want something to work, I, I can plug in a battery and whatever, and it doesn't work. But um, <laughs> but no, if you if you actually think that maybe Powell's trying to repeal the put, what's scary about it is that he's not just going to have to undo the excesses of that whole two year COVID stimulus spectacular. He has to go repeal basically 30 years of Pavlovian behavior that's been beaten into this market. Exactly. And you can see over the last 12 months how ineffective he's been at that. You know, he keeps saying higher, longer, we want tighter financial conditions. And the markets initially went down and then we're like, okay, we've gone down enough. Now they're going to pivot and they're going to come rescue us. So we're going to discount that and go off to the races. Um, so this this saga, if that's what Powell really wants to accomplish, you know, it could get really painful. And again, you know, I hate to sound like uh, I, I, I'm some kind of sadist, but I think it would be the best thing for our economy in the long run and for right. the markets to actually finally cleanse these excesses and get the Fed out of the job of, um, you know, basically enriching Wall Street. <laughs> right. Um, I don't I don't think you either. I don't harbor any illusions that they're going to fully get out of the job, but but they would love for it not to be as deformed as it is right now, because um, mm -hmm. eventually that risks a social break that you know, puts the risk, the, the rich at risk. Um, you know, so Stephanie, a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, John Hathaway, was on this program mm -hmm. recently and you know, to your point, you know, like personally, I, I, I do admit to some schadenfreude watching the Fed's challenges here with the markets because they're mm -hmm. wrestling with a monster that they created, Absolutely. as you said. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyways, what, what John said is uh, and this will be a very rude awakening for investors, is he said, I don't think the Fed cares where the stock market is. He said, you know, and ultimately, probably they do want it to come down and, and get valuations to be more normalized. Um, he said what they care most about right now is inflation. That's priority one through 20. Um, and they don't care if the market gets cut in half or two thirds or whatever to make that happen. They just want it to be orderly. Yeah. Right. They just don't want to have it break so that they have to come in and, and intervene with a rescue. But if if the you know, the gains of the asset bubble over the past 20 plus years, get fully bled out here, as long as it's orderly, that doesn't care. Probably yeah. happy for that. Yeah, um, I would agree with that. I guess um, we could have a whole debate as to the probabilities that it's orderly. So, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> and he wasn't arguing that it was going to be orderly. No, I know John wasn't arguing that. Yeah. Sure. But, yeah. Uh, but again, that's your point. That is a completely different Fed than this market uh, has you know, known and grown to love over the past 30 years, as you and I have talked about. You know, the, the the athletes in the financial system, as well as all the individual retail investors, they have built their muscles for mm -hmm. that world. So they their, their current musculature does not fit the world that we're currently in. If indeed the Fed put is is dead and, and yeah. Powell is just trying to get everybody to realize that. Yeah. All right, Stephanie. Um, this has been fantastic. As we wrap up, I just want to use my godlike powers here to share a couple of resources with folks. Um, a reminder that Wealthy on Spring Conference is now less than a month away. And Stephanie, you are going to be a featured speaker at that conference. So if you want more uh -huh. folks, uh, make sure you, you, you head over and register for the conference. Uh, to go do that, uh, just go to wealthion.com slash conference. And a reminder, if you can't actually watch live the day of the conference, which is Saturday, March 18th, replay videos of the entire event are going to be sent to everybody who registers afterwards. So you can watch those replays. Uh, to your heart's content. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, very challenging environment to figure out how to navigate as an individual investor. Um, 
you see me interview and, and talk with uh, wealthy on endorsed financial advisors on this channel every week i'm about to hop off this conversation with stephanie to record with the guys from new harbor in just a couple of minutes um, if you want to have a free consultation with one of the advisors uh, that's on this channel um, they will tell you exactly what they think you should do you can take that information you can do it yourself you can hand it to your existing financial advisor if they're a good one or you can keep talking to those guys if you like um, but to set one of those free no strings attached no commitment consultations up just go to wealthion.com um, stephanie again it's just always mm -hmm. a joy to have you on the channel thanks yeah, so much for coming on from the comments here looks like folks really like this format still so we'll keep it going as long as you're willing to come back on the program my pleasure i love it <laughs> all right everybody else thanks so much for joining us and thanks so much for watching thanks okay bye